right. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining um, and in this presentation around DBT. Um, really excited to um, explore what DBT is, get more information. I'm only using the acronym, so we really can walk away feeling like we learned something. If we're not familiar, I'm kind of mid-key cheating, but not really. Um, but also how we can use some of these tools, even though we don't practice therapy in our chatting space, um, to better support uh, members or maybe recognize some things and ask different questions, those kinds of things that make us better listeners. So with that being said, I'm really excited to introduce Rachel. So Rachel, I'm going to go ahead and pin you and let you take it away. Thank you so much, BJ. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And great. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be giving this presentation and I'm really appreciative of having this opportunity to talk with you all and share about um, what I've researched and learned about uh, dialectical behavior therapy or DBT as BJ said. So just really quick background um, on me, uh, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, currently, I'm a social work student uh, intern at Hear Me. Um, I, my background is a little bit uh, non-traditional in that um, this is a new career path for me. So I um, am actually a trained opera singer and have gotten my degrees in classical vocal performance. Um, when I was pursuing my master's degree, um, I ended up teaching and really was very interested in academia and education. I've done a bunch of teaching and administrative roles and that sort of all led me to recognizing and realizing the need for um, being able to help students in a more official capacity when it came to mental health issues that seem to be, in, there's an increasing need for um, social workers in, in schools. So that is how this all uh, led me to pursue my MSW degree. Um, okay. So what is... Oh, I'm sorry. This is not okay. Um, what is dialectical behavior therapy? What is DBT? So it is an intervention strategy um, and it is evidence based. That's really important to point out. Um, when we use intervention strategies, we really um, ideally want to use ones that are that are evidence based. Um, this particular um, strategy uh, came about to help individuals who were really struggling to um, manage as well as regulate emotions. Um, it was developed by Dr. Marsha Linehan. She is an American psychologist um, and it was based on or is based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, some of you may have heard of that. Um, it, that uh, is something that I was more aware of rather than DBT, even, even though DBT has really been around for a few decades. Um, CBT sometimes is something that um, people are, are more familiar with. There are more um, therapists, for example, who are trained in CBT. Um, and so that is what DBT is is based on. Um, Dr. Linehan found that CBT was not effective for for some individuals who needed to to practice other skills um, like acceptance, for example. So it merged through there. And then, what does DBT mean? Um, oh, sorry. Um, so dialectics basically just means dialectical or dialectics is the integration of opposites. So it, it basically means that two opposing views can be true at the same time. And we'll see sort of how that, that comes into play. 
um, hold on one second. There we go. And then behavior therapy, right? Teaching, teaching techniques and, and strategies for, for dealing with various feelings and, and situations. So this is how it all um, comes together for DBT. So as I mentioned, Dr. Uh, Marsha Linehan uh, is the developer founder um, of DBT. Um, Dr. Linehan published um, the first manual in, in 1993. Um, she'd been working on this research way prior to that, but that's when the first um, manual came out. And then a second manual was published just, just a few years ago. Um, the research that she was conducting at the time was on, on suicide prevention. And um, the reason, or one of the main reasons that she was uh, so interested in this work is because she herself and she talks about it. If you watch videos of her, they're really um, quite captivating and very interesting. Um, but her, her personal life really affected what she was interested in pursuing professionally. Um, so she uh, was struggling with her own set of mental health issues, really influenced her, her work. Um, and she developed um, the biosocial theory. So how um, people interact with their environment and, and how that leads to challenges with, with dealing with um, regulating uh, mood and emotions. Um, and uh, originally, initially, um, DBT was really thought to be only effective or was really only going to be used with, with those who were diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Um, however, um, as people began to become aware of DBT and more research was conducted, um, this research really demonstrated that there's actually a number of diagnoses that, um, or, or sorry, rather individuals with various diagnoses who really can and do benefit from DBT. Um, and as you can see, we have, we have a list here of just some of the diagnoses of individuals who can really benefit um, from DBT and learning the DBT skills. Um, it, you know, it, it works for all genders, it works for or helps um, children, adolescents, and adults. And something that I'm personally really excited about is that it's being used in the school setting. So there's a separate um, uh, it, it, you know, of course, it's all based on the same set of skills, but they're sort of adapted for different settings and um, different individuals or different groups. So, of course, the way it's taught to uh, children is going to be different than adults. Um, and then lastly, um, something that I was... Um, previously interested in um, was looking into if um, individuals with intellectual disabilities, if this is something that's accessible to them. And I, I actually initially um, thought that it wasn't based on some preliminary research that I was looking into, but uh, looking more into it and actually talking to a couple of um, therapists who do uh, DBT, who are uh, trained in it, um, I did learn that um, Dr. Julie Brown, who is a psychologist, um, came up with a way, a system to make it more accessible for individuals with intellectual disability. So that's um, really neat. And I was really pleased to, to learn that. That was some new information for me. So in terms of cultural relevance, which of course is also a really important topic and how does that tie into DBT? So as um, Dr. Linehan is an American psychologist, initially it was created in English, but there have been manuals published in Spanish and in Greek. And then there is currently, there's um, an unofficial translation in Russian um, one thing that makes DBT um, a little bit challenging to, to do these uh, translations successfully and well is that um, 
there's a lot of acronyms that are used for, and you'll see a little bit later on in the presentation, there are acronyms um, that an individual needs to learn in order to learn the skills. And so that can be a little bit challenging when trying to translate from English to other various languages. And lastly, something that um, also is important to mention is that there were adaptations made for um, uh, BIPOC communities in the US. And um, this was something that was felt like it was very important you know, to really consider and to dive into. Um, however, after more research was conducted, I, I think, you know, something like 18 different articles about this, ultimately it, it stated that these weren't necessarily uh, more effective. Um, so I thought that that was an interesting thing as well. So what are the goals of DBT? Um, there, are, there are many. Um, but a few, the most important ones we have here, um, to provide a validating environment for the client. So the client really needs to feel heard and seen and validated with whatever it is that they're dealing with and going through. It's also to teach coping skills. If you're facing a situation or a problem, how do you cope in a constructive and healthy way? Um, then to eliminate life-threatening and, and self-harm behavior, that's very important. Um, to reduce, I mean, these are all important, um, but you know, especially that's at, at an elevated level of, of crisis. So um, the next one being to reduce therapy interfering behavior. So an example of that would be um, somebody who doesn't recognize or acknowledge they have a problem, or if you take that a step further, somebody who has a problem and it's negatively impacting somebody else and they're not aware of that. So that's what we mean by therapy interfering behavior. And then lastly, what Dr. Linehan uh, really wants to emphasize is that the overarching goal of DBT is to help the client create a life worth living. And I think that's a really poignant way of sort of all encompassing what, what is the client going to get out of DBT. So how does the skills part of DBT work exactly? And as we get a little bit further, we'll talk about how this specifically can help us as, as listeners and what that might look like. But the idea of the skills are that they're gonna be taught um, to the client. There are, there are four different categories or modules and within each category or module, there's, there's different skills. Um, so those skills all need to be taught. There are a lot of skills, a lot of skills. Um, so it actually takes quite a long time to learn, um, to understand and then learn and then be able to practice each set of skills. So the client then after the client is, is taught these skills, they get to practice the skills in a practice situation. So that might be in a group setting or an individual setting, but they have the opportunity to practice the skills then they're going to practice or use the skill um, in a real life situation. And one thing that's really special about this is if the client runs into like any challenges or obstacles with this, they can actually contact their therapist or the you know, person who they're, who they're working with in between sessions. That's an expectation of both the client and the clinician that there can be this contact in between sessions to say, oh, you know, I, I had a problem with this. I tried to practice the, the please skill and here's what I, here's the challenge that I ran into. Can you, can you help me with this? Um, so I think that that's a really neat and uh, beneficial aspect of DBT work. And then lastly, the client can discuss and, and should discuss what worked and what didn't work. Um, whether they're doing individual therapy and or if they're in a skills group. So you, you might do both. You might have a therapist you're working with one-on-one -on -one, and then you might also be part of 
a group um, where you're learning the skills all together. So as I mentioned, these are the four um, modules or, or categories um, for DBT skills. Um, so the first one is emotion regulation. So basically how to change your emotions, how, how to alter them. Um, the next one is interpersonal effectiveness. So basically, if you want to think of it as simplistically as possible, how can you stand up for yourself without ruining relationships with people, right? We probably have all been in situations where we're trying to hold a boundary, but we're concerned about what that might that what might look like and how that might negatively um, impact that relationship, whether it's a personal or professional one. The next module, next category, distress tolerance, how to, how to deal with difficult situations. Um, and lastly, mindfulness. And, you know, this is a big, a big component um, and an important one. DBT is actually the first um, evidence-based practice to incorporate mindfulness. So that's really, really cool, I think. Um, and, and mindfulness being that you need to be fully present um, so that you really can engage positively um, in your life. And, and one very important aspect of mindfulness is, is the idea that you can't multitask. Um, it's, not, it's not effective to achieve, to achieve mindfulness. So how is this treatment delivered? Um, there are you know, four ways. Um, the first is to have individual psychotherapy, right? So you're working one-on-one -on -one with the client and the clinician. Um, the next is DBT skills training. So that's group work. You can actually do this really effectively through telehealth. There are a lot of remote options um, for becoming part of a DBT skills training, uh, a group. Um, and it's, you know, typically a weekly thing and you're meeting together and you're looking at the, the workbook, which I'll talk about later, and you're learning the skills and you're talking about it and you even get assigned homework. So you have to practice, you know, this set of skills and then you come together the next week and, and discuss how that went. Um, there's also in the moment phone coaching, which is really fabulous as well. So the, the therapist, the, the therapist is available to the client to really, you know, go through the, the skill with, with the client in the moment. And then lastly, um, this is also really important is that if you are somebody, if you are a clinician, if you are a therapist, who is trained in DBT, you're, you're still, you are still part of a consultation team. So um, th that group would also meet weekly as well. And you're sharing, um, you know, information about what worked and what didn't work as well at the clinician level. So that's really wonderful as well. So um, obviously this is, a very important topic. How does this actually play out and relate to what we're doing at Hear Me? How can we take all of this information and these skills and, and apply it directly to our work as, as listeners? Um, so some of the skills um, really can be and are applicable to our chats. I've, I've used a handful of them myself. Um, a lot of the skills um, are really linked to how to take care of ourselves physically and how that manifests and how that affects our emotional and intellectual, you know, well-being. So um, that's an important part of this as well. Some of these skills are also really practical and sort of easier to understand, very straightforward to learn and read and then apply in the moment. And, and those are the ones we'll, we'll talk about in a few minutes um, that can be shared, I think, pretty successfully with, with our chatters. Um, and for, for those of us who have dedicated chatters, that's an extra layer of an opportunity to um, work with them, teach them a skill, have them ask questions about it, um, and, then, and then revisit that and see if they were able to actually 
take that skill and and apply it to a to a real life situation. Um, so that's that's how you would teach the skills is explain it. Then the chatter has the opportunity to ask the questions, and then you know you you follow up with them and see how it actually went. So one of my personal favorite skills is the please skill. It's from the module of emotional regulation. Um, but this has a lot to do with how we can get ourselves physically healthy in order to achieve better mental health. So I'm going to um, play this short uh, video clip for you all. The please skills are skills with- I just want to pause and make sure that you can hear that. Yes, we can. That... Okay, wonderful. This of reducing vulnerability to negative emotions, mood swings, or high levels of emotionality. More generally, they're skills for reducing vulnerability to being affected by a lot of stress and increasing emotional resilience. PLEASE is an acronym that stands for five separate skills reducing vulnerability by taking care of physical illness, balancing eating, avoiding mood altering drugs or alcohol, balancing sleep, and getting exercise. First, treat physical illness by taking care of your body. Being sick lowers your defenses to negative emotions, while being healthy increases your capacity to regulate your emotions. Avoid becoming sick by taking your medications as prescribed and getting regular checkups. When you are sick, it's important to take care of yourself by getting sufficient rest, scheduling a doctor's appointment, taking prescribed medication, and following through with- Oh, so sorry. ...and for five separate skills, reducing vulnerable drugs or alcohol, balancing sleep, and getting exercise. First, Treat physical illness by taking care of your body. Being sick lowers your defenses to negative emotions, while being healthy increases your capacity to regulate your emotions. Avoid becoming sick by taking your medications as prescribed and getting regular checkups. When you are sick, it's important to take care of yourself by getting sufficient rest, scheduling a doctor's appointment, taking prescribed medication, and following through with recommendations. The second skill is balancing eating by making sure that you're eating consistently, not eating too much, and not eating too little. Eating several times throughout the day and eating healthy foods is also important. You may also want to avoid foods that you know makes you feel unwell or makes you feel overly emotional or vulnerable. The third skill is avoiding mood-altering substances. Alcohol and drugs can reduce your defenses against stress and intense negative emotions. Although in the short term, substances can perhaps make us feel more relaxed or calm, in the long term, they can cause more problems. Coping with difficult situations in a way that doesn't involve resorting to mood-altering drugs or alcohol is a good place to start. And if you are going to use alcohol, do it in a moderate way that doesn't make you more vulnerable. Know yourself and know the effect that substances have on you in the long run, including the next morning. The fourth skill is balancing sleep. Again, not sleeping too much or too little, knowing what gets in the way of you having a good night's sleep and trying to reduce those things. Practicing good sleep hygiene. For example, getting rid of devices before sleep, not watching TV in bed, avoiding caffeine before sleeping, and going to bed and waking up around the same time every day. The majority of people need somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep in order to feel more capable of tolerating distress. So if you're having trouble with that, think about what you can change in your life to increase the likelihood that you can get balanced sleep. The fifth and final please skill is getting exercise, doing some sort of exercise or movement for at least 20 minutes each day. When you're finished exercising, your parasympathetic nervous system is activated which induces feelings of calm and reduces vulnerability to stress and negative emotionality. Think about what's feasible and enjoyable for you. Walking, running, stretching, or playing sports are examples. Putting your sneakers in an obvious place or finding an exercise buddy can help you with this skill. 
You're likely not going to master all the please skills in one day. That's okay. Where can you start? Remember, we're reducing emotional vulnerability through treating physical illness, balancing eating, avoiding mood-altering substances, balancing sleep, and getting exercise. Start by thinking about what you want to more actively work on and identify a few realistic steps and ways you've been successful in the past to get going. Great. Um, and, and a couple of things I want to point out, um, looking through a couple of manuals, um, the L was listed in some places as limiting screen time, just generally. Also, of course, it was mentioned in having uh, good sleep hygiene, one thing that you can do and, and suggest to somebody if um, they're having trouble with insomnia and, and sleep related issues is limiting screen time before trying to go to sleep, but also just generally. Um, and then in terms of the last E for, for exercising, um, there's, you know, varying research on this about how much you really need, um, how much exercise you really need. And um, ultimately the two most important things with that are doing it frequently. So daily, ideally, um, and doing it at least 20 minutes. And, and some, some things did say try for 45, but again, you really want to, um, set realistic goals. So if, if you don't have the time or the bandwidth for that, even doing 20 minutes, like the video said is, is really beneficial. Okay, so um, the tip skill, this is from the distress tolerance uh, module or category. Um, and the T uh, stands for temperature. So changing your body temperature, excuse me, um, to activate the dive reflex. So there's a lot of research about this. There's actually um, people who will get a, like a, a bowl of wa ice water and um, put your head, fully submerge your head into that, activating that dive reflex can really um, calm you down. There's a lot of information about that. It's been, it's been proven. Um, we already talked about intense exercise, but that's also part of this skill as well. So right, getting your, your heart rate up, doing this consistently, frequently, and, and daily is, is really beneficial. Um, paced breathing, the idea with this is to exhale for longer than you're going to inhale and to, as it says, right, pace your breathing, focus on your breathing and make sure it's, it's even. Um, and then lastly, doing some paired muscle relaxation. This is basically going through doing sort of like what we would call a body scan and tensing up a muscle group or a specific muscle and then releasing that tension and really just focusing on that. So again, this skill is focusing on physical things that you can do to ultimately regulate your emotions. So it's all, all connected. Okay, this next skill is the dear man skill. And this is, um, part of the interpersonal effectiveness module. If you remember, that's how do you manage situations with people where you're, again, you're trying to hold a boundary um, or, or self-advocate, but also not have that negatively impact that relationship. Again, whether that's a personal one or professional one, um, th that can apply to, to both of those types of relationships. So we have another um, video clip here as well. Um, I'll point out both of these video clips, the one that we did on the police skill and this one are from um, Rutgers. And that's a really um, reliable, excellent, excellent resource. So um, I'd highly recommend checking out other videos as well from them. So here's the dear man skill. Dear man is an interpersonal skill set used when you'd like to ask someone for something in a way that will more likely get them to say yes. It's based on assertiveness training models and can be extremely effective depending on several factors. 
You may find as you listen that assertiveness like this doesn't fit with what you've learned from your family or your culture. That's okay. See if there's anything within this skill that could still work for you. The term dear man is a way to remember each skill. Describe, express, assert, reinforce, stay mindful, appear confident, and negotiate. First, describe the current situation using just the facts. For example, you told me you would do the dishes last night, but this morning when I came downstairs, the dirty dishes were still there. This helps orient the person to exactly what you're reacting to. You might be tempted to say more like, you're always annoying with this stuff. Don't do this. Keep your describe short, concise, and objective in order to grab the person's attention and avoid making them feel defensive. Next, express clearly how you feel or your opinion about the situation. Don't assume the person knows how you feel. For example, I felt disappointed when I saw the dishes weren't done. By sharing your personal reaction, you're helping the person understand why you're making the request. Next, assert your request by clearly asking for what you want. Don't assume the other person knows what you want. Be clear, concise, and specific. For example, can you please do the dishes now? Or, if you know you're not going to get to the dishes, can you tell me so that I can do them and we can have a clean sink in the morning? Notice how each assert was a question. It's not enough to simply express, I'd like you to do the dishes. It's also not effective to demand, do the dishes now. Asking an assertive question can be uncomfortable for people at first and may require a lot of practice. Finally, reinforce or reward the other person ahead of time by explaining what they could gain by giving you what you want. At a minimum, this can be expressing appreciation or gratitude just by saying, I'd really appreciate it. Or try being more specific to the situation. Our living space would be cleaner, which would make me less stressed. I know I'm a lot easier to live with when I'm not so stressed. Now the other person might interrupt you, argue with you, or try to change the subject. This is why it's important to use the skill of staying mindful of your goal in the situation. If needed, express your opinion or reassert your request again and again. It might feel silly or you might be tempted to change up your script. Instead, just repeat in a calm voice, can you please do the dishes now? Or, I would still like you to do the dishes now. If the person responds with their own request, becomes mean, or tries to divert you, don't take the bait. Stay on topic and be mindful of your request. It also helps to appear confident with your voice and body posture. Convey that you know what you want and you're deserving of it too, while still respecting the other person. Don't whisper, stammer, or look down. Instead, speak up and stand tall. The skill is called appear confident, not be confident for a reason. Fake it until you make it. Finally, negotiate if you need to. Be willing to give in order to get. This may involve reducing your request or offering another solution to the problem. For example, how about I unload the dishwasher first so you can empty the sink? Another way to negotiate is to turn the tables and ask the other person for solutions. What do you think we should do? I would like a clean sink in the morning and you really seem to not want to do the dishes at night. How can we solve this problem? Dear man can also be used to say no to a request. Using the same steps, say no clearly. If someone asks you to hang out and you wanted to say no, a dear man response could look like this. Hey, I'm feeling pretty drained and tired. I can't hang out today. I'd be more fun on a different day when I have more energy. Can we hang out one day next week instead? Notice how describe wasn't necessary since the person already knew what you were reacting to. Notice how you asserted clearly, I can't hang out today, instead of saying something unclear like, I don't think I can today, or I'm not sure. Dear man is a skill that works best when practiced. Practice writing your dear man out ahead of time and rehearse in front of a mirror or another person. Describe, express, assert, reinforce, stay mindful, appear confident, and negotiate when necessary. So with these few skills, um, I really do genuinely believe that they're skills that could be, could be taught and, and used. Um, in a, in a hear me chat, whether it's a one-time chat or it's, it's with a, 
a dedicated chatter. These are fairly um, straightforward skills to teach um, and very effective um, when, when they're executed properly. Oops. Um, so I believe we do have time to do this. Um, I, if, if you're all willing, uh, thought it would be helpful to get into a few breakout groups and to talk about this, this last skill um, that I wanted to share with you all. This is the observe your breathing skill. Um, and it's from the uh, mindfulness category or module. Um, and what I'm going to do is um, take the instructions and I can drop them in the chat so you can refer to them. But what I'd, I'd love for you all to do in your groups is to read through these instructions and, and see either, either try it out and or see how you think that this may or may not be applicable to using with chatters um, when, when you're a listener on the app. Is this something that you could walk a chatter through or maybe does it not make sense and, and why or why not? So BJ, am I able to do that or um, assign breakout groups? Um, you are, but I can just do it quickly. <clears throat> How many okay. people would you okay. like per group? Oh, sorry. Um, let's do, I don't know, actually, I haven't looked at how many of us are on, uh, okay. right now, but, but, you know, just two or three or three people, maybe three Great. Or anything um, like did, that is okay. Did you drop the instructions in the chat? I didn't because I had them. Uh oh. I'm going to go right here and then go back to the chat. And sorry. Um, for some reason, I apologize, everyone. I just am trying to. get get the chat my apologies one second here we go um, all right there we are and how long would you like people to be in the sessions for so let's go, it's 139, let's go till 145. I think that's plenty of time. That should be okay. Okay. Wonderful, thank you, BJ. Yep. Give me one second. <clears throat> Absolutely. Oaks even. Okay, so I think we're probably mostly, if not all, um, back. And um, I'll, I'll put you on the spot. If, if you're willing to um, share what you discussed in your breakout group, you can either unmute yourself and, and share um, what you discussed, or you could put it into the chat if you feel more comfortable. Um, and if not, that's all fine too. We had a good conversation in my breakout group. So I'm also happy to share that as well. Um, but this is the opportunity if anybody would like to uh, share what you all discussed.
in uh, my group, there was some confusion because I guess I was told by my supervisor that like implementing um, like therapeutic interventions wasn't something that we do as hear me listeners since we're not therapists, you know? So I was never, I was told like not to give like or walk them through like a breathing exercise or walk them through like anything that like teaching them the skills because that's something like a dbt therapist would do not like a listener like our job is more to be like active listeners and um things like that that's just what i was told but i know there was someone else in my group that was told something different by their supervisor got it so that's a a very valid point and i think um one thing and i i think if rick is here and willing to to jump in rick I, uh, you could but i am so each each supervisor will, will will support you know their students through it um you know we're not going through doing dbt therapy um dbt therapy or dbt these skills can be used um individually for almost anything that's going on um so breathing is breathing um, whether they watch a YouTube video on it or you walk them through, you know, square breathing, it's it's a basic skill. So it's it's really the way you're, you're framing it with um, uh, your listener. They're not coming to us for looking for therapy. So we're, that's not that's why you're hearing we're not doing therapy. But if they're if one of these skills, you know, I. I know how to do all of these, right? Right, because I'm a therapist. But even if I don't, I've used many of the skills in my personal life to work through things. So you're sharing from your experience. So it's it's your it's the way you're framing it. Um, was that you, Jen? I was sending you a, a message as well. But yeah, so yes. you know, it's it's your your. Does that make sense? A little more sense to you? Yes, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because we're not doing I, that's very helpful. Yeah, we're not doing long term therapeutic techniques. You're just somebody struggling with the feeling. You're helping them, you know, uh, talk about different ways to make sense of the feeling. And that's what we do. And that's what therapists do as well. But we just do it in a different, you know, package. Right. Thank you so much, Rick. That's you said it much better than I could have. And um, I think. Yes, I, I would say, you know, I, I have, um, I should have mentioned this, so I apologize, but, you know, I haven't ever said, okay, like, let's do some DBT. I think that it's more just picking a few of these skills that um, could be applicable to certain chats or certain chatters, um, you know, in that moment, but certainly disclosing yes of course i'm not this is not a therapeutic intervention intervention that i am you know walking you through it's just um you know here are some skills and here's how they might help you with this this situation but that's a really good point and thank you for bringing it up um did anybody else want to share anything In the comments, Becky added, we talked about how it can be a really useful skill to discuss with members that they can use throughout their day, before work, getting ready for bed, anytime they need to take a breath break, but that it might <clears throat> be a little bit more difficult to facilitate a mindfulness session via text during a chat, rather than on something like Zoom, where you can use audio to narrate the steps so they can get comfortable and relax, maybe closing their eyes. That is a perfect, <laughs> um, that's a perfect way of putting all of that. I 100% I agree with all of that. Th thank you so much for writing that um, so well. Um, and, and we also talked about that a little bit as well in our breakout group that absolutely this, this might be something that makes more sense to um, outline for the chatter and say, if you find yourself in a situation like this, try this. Um, and you know, may, maybe um, throughout the day, right? So I think I think that's a perfect way of putting it, and how it could really be useful and helpful. Um, but that it would be challenging, right, to like walk them through it because sometimes um, there's a lag in the chat, or or you're not perfectly in sync, and so 
being able to coach them through it exactly in that moment absolutely could could present some some challenges um so thank you so much that's really really helpful um one thing that we discussed a little bit was uh really being very intentional um with this so the three two four um you know listed here um is is important to to point out so the idea of inhaling specifically through your nostrils for three seconds there's actually like some some studies i read about why um and how it's helpful to to breathe in through your nose as opposed to through your mouth so it's very interesting but um right the idea of that inhalation lasting for three seconds holding the breath for the two seconds and then exhaling through your mouth through the four seconds. So really having that order in that specific way, um, you know, a lot of people might not be aware of. A lot of us know like, oh, take a deep breath. We hear that all the time, right? But to do it in this specific order in this particular way, I think is something that's um, worth pointing out and would and would be helpful um, to, to share with a, with a chatter potentially. Um, did anybody else, I also don't wanna, I wanna respect everybody's time, make sure I don't run over the two o'clock mark. Um, so let's see. In the chat, uh, Brindea said, a lot of the time I asked them if I could send them a resource for breathing exercises and if they would be interested in, in it, then send them links to apps and such. Yeah, that's great. And actually, um, I'd love to know what what apps you found um, because I think there's so much, there's a lot of really good resources out there. And of course, some of them are um, more well-known. Some of them might be, you have to pay for them. So, you know, there's so much information out there. Um, I actually um, uh, shared, shared one here, a few resources um, and mindfulness app that, um, I've looked into a lot and found to be very useful and effective as Headspace. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of that, but definitely I highly recommend um, checking that out. Um, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say, and also as Brindea, you know, and demonstrated, uh, Lisa points out, and just a reminder that we need to ask permission, basically consent from the client before suggesting a breathing exercise. So before we make a recommendation, kind of getting that consent rather than just kind of knowledge bombing people um, when that's not what they're looking for. Absolutely. So this is definitely something that's not going to be appropriate for everyone. And if it's a case by case basis. So it's, it's a very good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, so while I'm on the resources page, um, you know, we all process information differently. We respond to different types of resources. And so um, there's a little something for, for everybody here, hopefully the first um, really quickly, it's a podcast with a psychiatrist, um, DBT professional. He was trained directly specifically by Dr. Linehan. I think he was like the first or second um, therapist uh, to be or clinician, you know, to be able to uh, do DBT with clients. He runs skills groups. He does individual psychotherapy. He's a professor at UMass. Um, and his podcast I've listened to. So I, I think it's absolutely uh, really fascinating, chock full of, of really helpful information. Um, and he has such a wonderful way of, of framing things very warm tone to him. So um, if you're into podcasts and you're interested in learning more, I'd highly recommend that. The next is a website. Um, I used a lot of the information on there for my research. Um, it's a very reliable resource, behavioraltech.org um, for, for training courses, various materials. There's some cl video clips on there. So really just a great um, resource full of, of accurate, um, helpful information. The next, we just talked about um, a mindfulness app. There's a lot of stuff out there as we, as I just said, but this mindfulness app in particular um, uh, is very beneficial if, if you are interested 
or somebody is interested in, in trying out some of those exercises. And then lastly, um, Dr. Linehan's workbook, it's the skills workbook, and it's basically handouts um, that you could, you know, literally photocopy and, and give out to a client after, you know, teaching them a skill. So it's um, the teacher in me really appreciates that. Um, it's, you know, very straightforward, it's organized. And um, again, that could be something that, that you might be interested in as well um, without, you know, being uh, officially trained as a DBT clinician, that's still, you could still get a lot of information out of it. Okay, um, and then here, of course, are my all of my references and all of that. So that's all I have for you. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. I really appreciate it. I know there's not a lot of time for questions, but um, one question I actually had was kind of in the earlier um, slides um, when you mentioned the adaptation of DBT for BIPOC communities. Um, I was very curious um, is if, if you had any insight as to what the contributing factors were, any information as to why um, it didn't yield the results that it was designed to. Um, I would have to comb through my notes to, I don't, I don't, I want to give the, the right information. So I'd be happy to send that out as a, as a follow-up. Um, but it had to do with um, language and tone and, and things like that. But, it, but again, I, I can, um, I can send, I can send that out because it was actually, I was sort of surprised by those findings. Um, that's a really good question. Cool. Um, well, if no one else has anything else in the comments, I'll just wrap this up and say, Rachel, thank you so much for presenting on this topic. I think a lot of those acronym skills, um, you know, with consent and introduction based on what we're experiencing in chats can be really helpful, especially when people are discussing, you know, particular issues and how they can communicate more effectively, right, to um, kind of get their needs met and uh, support the direction they want to go and, you know, useful skills going forward in general. Um, your presentation will be made available along with a recording. We'll probably get that out in the next few days, if not by next week, I'm trying to package all of these together. Um, actually, I take that back. The person who edits our videos will be going on vacation, but we'll get these um, available to you as soon as they're up and running. Outside of that, have an amazing day. Thank you so much for presenting and we'll see you back, I believe, tomorrow for another presentation in the evening. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.